Hello. I'm Betty Furness. On television these days, you see a lot of fascinating stories under the heading of science fiction. But right now, I'd like to talk about science that is fact, but so exciting it sounds like fiction. How will his work affect your life? Will he find new ways to cure our diseases, cook our food, heat and cool our home, wash our clothes? The answer to these and lots more questions are in the new Westinghouse Research Laboratories. You know, most buildings aren't too interesting in themselves. But when you get a building filled with people whose minds are really boiling over, as they are in this building, you never know what they're liable to come up with. Maybe one of those spaceships your small son is always talking about. Maybe a new way to detect disease and thus save your life. Maybe a way to make life safer for that son of yours in the Air Force or the Navy. Well, anyway, they're working on all sorts of things like that here. And here, to take us on a tour of this wonderful place, is Dr. John A. Hutchison, Vice President of Westinghouse and Head of all Westinghouse Research Activities. Hello, Dr. Hutchison. Hello, Betty. I'd be delighted to take you on this tour. Uh, doctor, isn't most of your work uh, sort of for men only, like uh, oh, spaceships and guided missiles and all that sort of thing? Not at all. In fact, the very first thing I'm going to tell you about is for the ladies. It's a new kind of light we call electroluminescence. Uh, uh, Electroluma Watsons? <laughs> oh, you know, these scientists always pick out jaw-breaking names for things like that. But when we get a little farther along, We'll give it to somebody in your department who'll think out a nice, clean one for it. You mean maybe in the three letters so we could put it on a box top? Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, let's call it electroluminescence. Well, you call it whatever you like, but you're going to have to cut out a couple of syllables if you want me to wrestle with it. <laughs> okay. Shall we go? We shall. We want to give the public a new kind of light, which comes from thin panes of glass like this. See? No lamps, no fixtures. The light just pours from the walls and ceiling. And one of the most amazing things about it is that you can change the light from one color to another just by turning a switch. It's so beautiful. And such interesting colors. This one's blue, this one's green, and this one's gold. Then, no matter what dress I wear, I can change the whole color scheme of my room just to match my dress? You sure can. <laughs> That's really one for the ladies. What's next? One for the men? Betty, I'm no miser. I'll give you another one for the ladies. Now, what do you say this is? In this house of miracles, I wouldn't venture to say. Uh, what do you say it is? It's a refrigerator. Oh, no. No, it can't be. You can fool me on some things, but not on a refrigerator. You see, if that were a refrigerator, I would feel a tingling in my refrigerator door opening arm, and I don't. Maybe your arm is right. It isn't a refrigerator yet, but someday it will be. You see, here's the remarkable thing about this. If you pass an electric current through any other little bar like this, it gets hot. But an electric current passed through this bar makes it cold. Here, for example, is a little pellet of ice frozen merely by running a current through this bar. Well, let's get away from refrigerators. Have you read about automation? Someone figured out the other day that in the near future, we won't be able to turn out enough goods to meet the needs of our growing population. If the people who work in our plants and factories do the same work they are doing now in the same way they are doing it today. So we really need automation. That's what Babby said. Have you been talking to her? Uh -uh. To get automation, you have to have long lines of machines all hooked up together and all operated by automatic controls, which can start the production lines or stop them, or speed them up or slow them down. Like this automobile assembly line, for example. Like this food processing line. The trouble with automation up to this time is that if anything went wrong with the control devices, a mile of production lines, or many miles of them, would all be shut down at one time. So research men out here invented a little electric brain that can control all these speeding lines and never break down or wear out and never let one get ahead of the other. Here's what they came up with. Doesn't look like much, does it? But this little thing has a brain and a memory. And when you hook it and its brothers and sisters together, 
They can make all kinds of difficult decisions and even know what to do in an emergency. It doesn't have much glamour, does it? No, but it can have a powerful influence on the price of your canned food or your automobile. Make mine a convertible with red wheels. You sound just like a Californian, a convertible with red wheels. When you were in California recently, did you have a convertible with red wheels? That's exactly what I had. Well, did you drive it down to Mount Palomar and look at the stars? Well, I looked at some stars, but uh, not at Mount Palomar. I think they call the place Hollywood. Wrong stars, wrong place. You should have driven down to Palomar because it would make it easier for me to tell you about this little gadget. Hollywood's pretty nice. At Mount Palomar, you'd have seen the 200-inch telescope. It's been called one of the greatest works of man. The 200-inch telescope cost $8 million, and it reaches out 2 billion light years into the heavens. Well, lately, a group of scientists out here have gotten stardust in their eyes again. They've been dreaming about what might be done to increase the effectiveness of such telescopes. They are working on this little light amplifier. Another side pack? Another mechanical brain? No, this is entirely different. It amplifies light. You put dim light in here, and it comes out here a couple of thousand times brighter. As you can see, it's a pretty small device, and it weighs only a few ounces. But we figure that someday it might increase the power of the Mount Palomar telescope by 10, 20, or even 50 times. Then we'll be able to see farther into outer space than ever before. And then who knows what we'll find. Perhaps whole new worlds we've never even dreamed about. Another group out here, working in a different direction, made great contributions in the field of medical x-ray. They found a way to amplify the light that creates the image the doctors see on the screen of their x-ray equipment. This allowed them to see the image many times more clearly and more brightly. You're wondering what this means to you? Well, funny thing about research, one thing leads to another. You remember the story you once told on Studio One about the little boy with the cleft palate? Oh, yes. That's the story of how Westinghouse developed the Cineflorex, which makes movies out of medical x-rays like this one showing a person swallowing. And x-ray movies like this helped doctors find a way to repair that boy's palate. That's right. In Cineflorex, the general principle is light amplification. Some deep x-rays used to be so dim that a doctor had to sit in a completely dark room for half an hour, doing nothing, until his eyes were accustomed to look at these dim x-rays. Now with this Westinghouse machine magnifying everything, the doctor can look at the x-rays immediately. And remember this story about the cat eye tube which lets airplane pilots see the ground on darkest nights? Same principle again, with a different twist. I know you fly a lot, so that must get close to home with you. What kind of people are these research men? How do they go about inventing things? Well, let me tell you a little true story about one of our men. Back around 1920, a Westinghouse scientist named Dr. Rentschler was trying to find a better metal for filaments in Westinghouse lamp bulbs. Know what that metal was? Uranium. That metal was used in the experiments that led to the atomic bomb. It helped usher in the greatest single change in the 20th century, atomic energy. That's how research works, Betty. You find out something, and somebody, somewhere, sometime, finds a way to use it. Take this man, for instance. Remember you saw a picture of him a few minutes ago? What's he doing? He's working on rare metals at Westinghouse. These metals are so pure, they can't be melted in any container without picking up impurities. This man is bombarding this piece of metal with radio waves until it floats suspended in midair. As this continues, the metal eventually melts, still hanging there, unsupported in the air. What good is it? Already pure metals like that are making it possible for us to design amazing new electric devices that you haven't even heard of yet. Well, Betty, that was a pretty quick look at a building that's full of fascinating things. Let's stop in here and see an old friend of yours who was a good friend of research, Mark Cresset, Executive Vice President of Westinghouse. I'd like that. Well, hello, Betty. Hello, Mr. Cresset. Good to see you. Thank you. Good morning, Hutch. How good are morning, you? Mark. How are you? Just well. well. Hutch, won't you and Betty uh, have a seat for a minute? Dr. Hutchison's been showing me some of the wonderful things that they're doing here at the research center. 
I just can't get over the tremendous activity that's going on. It must take quite a lot of courage for the company to invest so much money in research. Yes, Betty, it would, if we hadn't had such a wonderful record of successes in the field of research. Right now, we are spending more than $150 million a year in research, development, and engineering. Besides this new research center, there are almost 200 other Westinghouse laboratories. But money buildings and machines didn't produce this successful record. This record was made by people. Today, Westinghouse has over 13,000 talented people, scientists, engineers, and technicians, all working on research and engineering development alone. Let's just consider a few of the creations of these men and women. It was Westinghouse research that led to the world's first atomic power plant in the submarine Nautilus. And that same research is helping us to build the country's first atomic power plant to generate electricity. It's about 20 miles from Pittsburgh, almost finished now. Then there's the Air Force radio network that can reach any American plane, wherever it may be. Its messages are sent by Westinghouse transmitters. The world's biggest electric motors, the world's purest metals, the power of the world's fastest ocean liner. These are just a few of the things Westinghouse scientists have helped make possible with their research. Right now, for instance, our research people are working on a metal so rare that it costs us about $5,000 a pound. But I'm willing to bet that it's not going to be too many years before that metal will make possible television as thin as a picture on your wall and automobile batteries that will never wear out. Yes, Betty, we're sure the work being done in this laboratory right here and now will have a direct bearing on our life in the future. And I'm the lucky one because I'll have the pleasant job of breaking the good news about all these bright new things after you and your associates think them up. And how I'll love that. I hope that you will join me in saying thanks to Dr. Hutchison and congratulations to Mr. Cressop. They're going to make sure that you and I enjoy a wonderful new way of living in a future that may be closer than we think. <laughs>